Yahoo, here we go. He gave me a thumbs up. So, good afternoon, late afternoon, evening. It is good to see all of you. We appreciate your being a part of our conversations and our meetings. Um, this is the regular meeting of the school board of the Bartholomew Consolidated School Corporation. Um, we have not met for about a month, so I've already said if I get rusty with all my protocol, I apologize ahead of time. We do start our meetings with reflections from individual board members. I'm sorry. Um, and I have that opportunity this evening, so I'll start off. I thought that we'd take this opportunity to reflect on what we've learned from this extraordinary challenging year. I had my own ideas, but I conducted some Google research, a new term in our world, to see what others have noted as lessons from the past year. And those articles are endless. I certainly could have gotten lost reading them all. So I offer to you a compilation of my own thoughts with themes from articles that I have read that have been written along with the words from one of our own eighth graders, a rising freshman. So first we have learned to use technology more creatively. Theater, music concerts, politics meetings, interactions with friends and family were different and available to us with new expansive use of technology. Here in BCSC, we offered online instruction in new ways, learned from the experiences, and now have an expanded virtual pathway to offer for the coming school year. Flexibility and resilience are new key words for all of us. Our ability and a willingness to change, to adapt, to think differently, now are increasingly important qualities to instill and to nurture in our children and our students. More importantly in my mind, we have learned the importance the value of interdependency as family members, community members, citizens of this country and the world. It is not enough only to take care of oneself, to follow guidelines selectively or as we choose. We continue to deal with a highly infectious virus out of respect and care for others, not just for ourselves following public health guidelines has been and continues to be important. We must care for others. People did rise to the occasion, responding to the needs of others and reflecting the extraordinary power of giving and widening the circle of our concern. The number of heroes we have relied on has been endless. We can't thank them enough. The value and importance of relationships, human interactions, of community, be it in one's family, neighborhood, school, or church, have been made so clear. Each of us, in some way, has realized how important human caring connections are to our own well-being. I will close using words from one of our eighth graders, Jessica Kang a student of Mindy Summers at Central Middle School. Jessica's essay, from which I've selected these words, will be a part of a special podcast and published by Cincinnati Public Radio. It was submitted to the Democracy and Me Student Voices competition. Jessica wrote, changes can happen at any time and anywhere. To weather the storm, you have to keep moving forward and looking toward the future, staying flexible, calm, and working together as a group is important to overcoming obstacles. She writes further, I believe there's always a solution to a problem. We are all holding on to something which is each other, staying connected during the darkest moments. Who knows what will come next? But one thing I am sure of is that every little or big change is a break in our glow stick to shine on for the future. After all, a glow stick needs to break to glow. I believe this is all a metamorphosis for the better. So thank you, Jessica, and thank you. 
If you are able, you're welcome to join us in standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. How fun, we are all here together, so we certainly have a quorum. I will call this meeting to order. We share here on the screen, it is also listed behind us, the mission and vision of our school corporation, as well as our high expectation objectives which guide all the decisions that we make during these meetings. <sighs> I love this book. So it is um, a regular now in our meetings for about a year that we get an update on our COVID-19 plans. Um, our plan of action now, soon to be for 21-22 at our next meeting, I would guess. I would guess so, yes. Thank you, Dr. Shedd. I will get into the COVID-19 update. We have been covering this topic, unfortunately, I guess, since March of 2020. I don't know how many exactly school, school board meetings that is, but it's been obviously quite a few. So I'll run through just a couple of pieces of information here as we end the school year. So first of all, in regards to the 2021 school year, we were, were able to end the school year uh, relatively successfully, given the, the student, the month of May allowed us to do several student-oriented things that we're not, we were not able to do uh, just a year ago. So for example, even though we ended the school year last year, uh, at around the same time it was supposed to, it was in a virtual way and even done differently in, in that we did not complete 180 student instructional days. We were actually in the 160s and just as an FYI, state statute indicates that we are supposed to have 180 student instructional days and a waiver was given for last school year. So we did indeed complete 180 student instructional days. Additionally, we were able to have prom uh, that was on May 1st at Northside Middle School. And then we also had three graduations. CSA New Tech graduated its students on Thursday, May the 27th. And we had Columbus East and Columbus North in order respectively on Saturday, May 29th. It was a little cold on Saturday morning the 29th, but we got them, got them through. Uh, this is just always data we're keeping you up on in terms of uh, the community's metrics. And so this does come from Bartholomew County. They continue to keep this information and you can see that it's now been several days we've been in the green on all those measures the per capita rate down to 1.5 that's as low as it's been uh, since the, the the data has been tracked by at least this as a community um, the percent positive test rate below five at 4.7 percent again a low watermark in terms of where we've been since we've been tracking this uh, test turnaround time just a, a day and COVID hospitalizations down at three it's been around that one, two, three number now for, for a while. In terms of the state, uh, the state of Indiana also came out with a set of um, metrics and this is uh, the map for the state of Indiana as of last week. Uh, so you can see where Bartholomew County is, that's the lowest score. I guess you could have a zero technically, but blue is the lowest color, 0 0.5 there is where we are. Since Monday, August the 10th, the first student day for this past school year, we have ended the school year, uh, since we're not counting cases for the school year any longer. 665 positive test cases, uh, that is 431 students, 162 support staff members, and 72 teachers. In terms of the population uh, representation of our students, 431 would be 4% of our student population. Uh, for our support staff members, which equals about 1,200 people, uh, 162 would be about 14% of our support staff members. And then of our teachers, which is about 800 when we add administrators to that group, uh, that's 9% of our certified staff members. Uh, during the course of the year, we also had 4,042 close contacts, as well as had done work, I guess, in terms of tracking information down on 2,562 symptomatic or pending tests. So probably a good time just to take a moment and thank uh, Kelly Thompson, our Director of Health Services, and the nurses in each of our buildings. They have plenty of work to do every year, and to add 
this quantity of, of stuff uh, to their plate this year. Uh, quite amazing, just when you look at those numbers. And so certainly appreciate the work. Kelly's back at the exit sign. Appreciate the work of Kelly and, and her team uh, this year. Uh, as, as in regard to the 21-22 school year, which will be here before we know it, I just dropped a quote in here from the Department of Health. The Indiana Department of Health has released some guidance, um, some preliminary information, but still recognizing that until June 30th, uh, the governor has an executive order in place for schools. Uh, but after July 1st, you as a local school board uh, will have the responsibility for implementing uh, whatever measures and restrictions are deemed necessary uh, to address COVID-19, and that in does include our buildings, facilities, grounds. It says including transportation right here, but that is a little bit um, interesting in that in other guidance, the, the um, uh, Department of Health has transportation is still cited under the Centers for Disease Control because the CDC is indicating from a public transportation standpoint that masks, for example, are still required and they're including school buses under that uh, information. So uh, that's It'll be interesting to see you as we, as we get to the end of June and head into July where uh, the state will be, at least on that particular piece. Um, in terms of our next steps, so as we look at 21-22, uh, you have another school board meeting, regular one, scheduled for uh, July 19th, so a little over a month away. Um, we will continue to review the guidance that is put in front of us with the Department of Health and the Centers for Disease Control. Additionally, as we did all year, as we'll consult with Dr. Nebalski and his team with the Bartholomew County Health Department, as well as our Columbus Regional Health Representatives, uh, we'll discuss with our Columbus Educators Association and just work through that as we get uh, ready for the school year. And then we'll also solicit stakeholder feedback. And I, as a, I passed the sheet past me, I know we have plenty of people here tonight to maybe comment on this topic. If it's a, another topic, I'm not yet aware of what that might be, but figured we would have some uh, responses or information input regarding uh, COVID-19 masks and those kinds of things. So that's a part of the soliciting uh, stakeholder feedback, but also getting something out electronically so people can fill that out, send us back some information, and we'll have that uh, on hand for you to help make a decision. Um, in terms of communicating publicly, our initial recommendation we made publicly the week of Monday, July 5th. So if we look at that timing, uh, July 4th is a Sunday. Uh, Monday is July 5th, so that week. And then that following week, the week of Monday, July 12th, we would communicate publicly again. As we did last year, we released information once, got a lot of feedback, made some tweaks to that recommendation, released it again, got some feedback, made some tweaks to that, brought that recommendation to the board, and, and then continue making uh, tweaks. Uh, hopefully it won't be as complicated as it was a year ago based upon what we, what we now know, uh, both from the data that I just shared, as well as other information we've compiled during the course of the year. But that second bullet point, again, just outlines formally what we would see as a community and as a board uh, in terms of recommendations and stair-stepping through that to get toward uh, the recommendation, the formal recommendation for you to consider at the Monday, July 19th meeting. I am aware that other school corporations have released some information already about how they uh, intend to approach masks, for example, um, and that's, that's, that's good that they've done that. Uh, the guidance, again, is that as of July 1st is when boards would be responsible for making that decision, and so we'll just follow that, that timeline in terms of information. So that is the update that I have. Board members, I would take any, entertain any questions that you might have in regards to this school year or thoughts about next school year at this point in time. All right, colleagues, do you have any particular questions at this point in time? Dr. Roberts, yes, have you um, communicated or, or uh, spoke with any other school districts on, I'm sure everybody's in the same yeah. boat. Daily, yeah, the, uh, yeah, so that, that's, that is something we, uh, as we interact with our colleagues, that's a regular conversation. That's a topic that's, that's out there and uh, the conversation about masks is the most pressing one, I think. And so just, just a reminder in terms of the mask piece, um, that was an executive order from the governor that even though things have loosened up throughout our community, throughout the state, uh, schools, at least inside, we're still required to, to have masks. So we've, we've continued to follow that and we'll through June 30th and then we'll look at what is appropriate. I did put in front of you just a summary of the Department of Health. So this is available on, on the, their website, the Indiana Department of Health, but just how they've uh, couched that in terms of their recommendations today. Um, but I, I don't think we'll get any more recommendations from the Department of Health for a few weeks as they have the governor's order expire and then come uh, back to the table with any any further recommendations so 
that is at least from a masks, quarantining, social distancing, those kinds of things. And if, if you recall, just a few meetings ago, we did change our social distancing to three feet in terms of identifying close contacts. That is consistent with the new recommendation or new us recommendations from the Department of Health in a classroom is to use three feet versus six feet. But there are, again, things that, that apply there, vaccinated or not, when it comes to a quarantining or identifying somebody as a close contact. So an example of the close contact, if we do have a positive test case, which we still will have one, and we identify close contacts, a person who is vaccinated would not be considered a close contact. But a person who is not, then we would have that same process that we went through um, in past years, that Thank large you. number of close contacts we had. You're welcome. Other questions? Dr. Yes. Roberts? Yes, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Do we have summer school or any activities in the summer that we will be tracking for anything? Yeah, sure, yes. Yeah. So, so we, we have kids in our building today, um, last week, two weeks ago, and will through this month. So as of today, we'll continue to follow what we have in place already from a 2021 school corporation standpoint. And we'll need to look at the month of July here uh, to, to see how we handle that with, with students in the building um, and, and other activities, you know, whether it's uh, band or, or athletics, whatever the case might be. Thank you. Mr. Stenner. I know it's hard to predict the future, but would you anticipate that um, it sounds like we're moving towards some kind of a voter decision at the July meeting? Would yes. you anticipate that that's the last time we'll deal with this? Or <laughs> as new information comes in, are we um, open and able to make changes? Yes. So I, I would love, Mr. Stenner, for it to be the last time we <laughs> We deal with this topic it has obviously consumed a lot of people's time and and, and it's just a challenging situation we've, we've made made the decisions and, and moved on uh, so i hope uh, when you vote on the recommendation on july 19th that'll be the last time you have to make a vote on that and, and maybe things will remain as as they are and continue to decrease and have numbers like those and that's the case but um yeah we, we'll, we'll see if that's the case and I, I wanted to check too are we down to the point now where we're just talking about masks or are we also talking about uh, distance between students, uh, screens, uh, yeah, yeah, in the yeah. classrooms so, and in offices. Uh, so, right, we've kind of got a whole uh, set of bullet points. That we, we, we do, and and so there there are certain mitigation strategies that I think we will continue to just be better at. Mm -hmm. Whether it's washing hands after certain things, like playing on the playground when maybe we didn't necessarily do that uh, before. Um, so, I, so there'll be mitigation strategies I, I can see us continuing to deploy. The physical distancing piece uh, is, is the guidance from the Department of Health is three feet physical distancing if there are, uh, if there are masks, six feet if there are no masks. So we would, we would have to make some decisions whether we follow the Department of Health's guideline uh, because there's a difference between just trying to practice physical distancing and then identifying people from a close contact standpoint. And we saw that this year, right? We, we, we tried to have a certain physical distancing amount, but regardless of what we were trying to do, once we had a positive case, we had to go back and see who was within a certain amount of feet and, and work through that. So whether it's at least trying to maintain some spacing, trying to cut down on um, opportunity. Uh, and, and I think what's interesting, and, and Kelly could attest to this from a uh, other situation, I gave the numbers from COVID-19. What's interesting is that we had very little other things. Other, other typical nurse visits decreased drastically. And, and cases of the flu, for example, um, were reduced to almost zero. Uh, some cases, but very, very uh, minimal number of, of cases of the flu. So masks or not, what other things can we be doing just to keep kids, us, staff healthy and in the buildings more often? So try to capitalize on some learnings there. And, and, and manage those. Thank you. You're welcome. Great questions for clarification, so thank you. I think I just have to say this, just as a reminder to all of us, we, we have a nurse in every school building. That is not true in many, many school corporations. So I am proud that we have made that decision, that we persistently find the money to do that in harder fiscal times. So thank you, Kelly, and all your colleagues. It has made a world of difference for all of us. All right. This is the opportunity for public comment. 
I do appreciate, we all appreciate those who are here. We have 15 individuals who have signed up. There's uh, one topic that seems to be a priority. We respect that, we wanna hear them all. Um, but, there, but there are more than just mask mandates listed on here. So I would ask that as we proceed through this evening, if you are late, I literally am just going to go down the way you signed in. If you've heard your comments already said, we still note your name. We appreciate that you're here. But we ask that you share new information with us. So as you heard, we are able to make an informed decision in July, rather than just repeat the same information. So with that, I'm gonna go with the first person who's listed here. It is Christy Stackhouse. If you'd come up. Just as a reminder, we have it written here, but we also like it recorded, your um, address. A reminder that we're at three minutes um, for everyone who'll be speaking tonight. So thank you for being here. Thank you, can I use this then? Yes, you do. Okay. My name is Christy Stackhouse, and my address is on the record there. I am so happy to be here and have this opportunity to speak and to see all of your smiling faces looking back at me. Wait, I can't, because your faces are covered. A smile can change a mood, and sometimes a school is the only place that a child gets to have that positive experience of a happy face. As of June 10th, 2021, the Columbus Bartholomew County COVID-19 Community Task Force reported a positive test rate down 4.3% with a two per capita positive rate. Yes, there was time when we needed to mask up for safety because that was our only option for protection from the virus, but that's no longer the case. Options are available. If a parent is concerned that their child will be exposed to or infected with the COVID-19 virus, that child's parents has the right to vaccinate or mask their child for his or her own protection. Parents also have the option of online school. According to Psychology Today, children's emotional well-being depends in part on neurological development, which comes from watching faces and recognizing emotions. Lack of neur neurological development will likely consequentially lead to academic deficits, the short and long-term effects on our children's future. While families make the choice on how to protect their children's physical health, I'm asking that the board to protect the children's mental health by removing the mandatory mask mandate. Thank you, Ms. Stackhouse. Next on our list is Mila Dempsey. You said it right. Oh, good, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Mila Dempsey. I have a student attending BCSE school and I'm a former BCSE student. Ms. Heine was my fifth and sixth grade teacher. So <laughs> we go way back, and I can tell you how many years. Um, first, I want to thank Dr. Roberts and the board for your timeless effort during this challenging period. All your hard work does not go unnoticed or unappreciated. However, I am truly concerned about parents' voices slowly being removed from the, de the decision making within BCSE. Do parents have input on BCS when BCSE chooses new curriculum to ensure that it's free from bias and it's nonpartisan? Do parents have a voice when BCSE is developing new policies and programs that directly affect BCSC students? Does BCSC have a robust system for parents to have an ongoing dialogue with school board members? In my experience, most school board members do not respond to emails submitted by parents with legitimate questions or concerns. When members of the community and parents decide to be bold and speak up at a school board meeting, why is there no interaction with the school board? Per the BCSC policy manual, under the philosophy of the board section, it states, and I quote, the board declares and thereby reaffirms it's an intent to maintain two-way communication with the citizens of the corporation and act as a truly representative body for citizens in all matters 
related to programs and operations, end of quote. I have yet to witness any outstanding examples of two-way communications between the board and the citizens of this community. I also would like to share my thoughts about the mask policy for the upcoming school year. I am asking for a mask policy that allows parents to choose the right to send their children mask or unmask, a policy in favor of parents' rights to determine what is best for their children. Per the CDC, children are the least at risk of COVID with a survival rate of 99.998%. Why then should we have such restrictive policies for our children resulting in long-lasting developmental interruptions? I have seen these developmental interruptions firsthand as my BCSC student has struggled with language and social development, and I believe that last year's mass policy was a contributing factor. In conclusion, I would like to see parents' voices playing a larger role in decision-making within BCSC and BCSC truly putting children first. Thank you. Thank you. Megan Johnson. Good evening. My name is Megan Johnson. Um, I just wanted to, I know that you all have a, a copy of the guidelines in front of you, but to make maybe other people that aren't aware of what those guidelines are um, from the Indy the Indiana Health Department. Uh, what we're looking at is grades kindergarten through sixth grade. Um, I'm, in, I'm including teachers and staff both uh, vaccinated. If you're vaccinated, there's no mask to be required. Uh, if you're unvaccinated, uh, you are to be wearing masks indoors at all times, as well as outside in certain situations. And these are our babies, right? These are our young babies. I mean, they're... <laughs> sad. They're babies. And then you move to uh, grades 7 through 12 uh, if you're vaccinated, no mask required. Um, if you're not vaccinated, uh, they're recommending masks indoors and outdoors. Uh, I strongly feel that uh, these are medical decisions that should be um, decided by a family member, not a board member. Um, I understand that there's a lot of stuff to look at, a lot of stuff going on. Um, I think the only way to accommodate an entire population would be to give them the freedom to choose. Uh, I, I don't um, discriminate. I believe that if, if you feel like masking your kids is the right thing to do, then it is for your kids. Uh, if it's not, um, then by all means, it's your right. Um, I think at the, the point that we're at now, I think it's safe to say that we should have the freedom to choose. Um, I wrote all this stuff out and I'm not even saying what I had planned to say. What I'm asking for, uh, Westfield Washington Schools is a, is a uh, school that's on the northeastern side of Indianapolis. Um, they just came out with an update for uh, their schools and reading it to you what it states is that uh, update for 2021-22 all uh, nine K through 12 schools will go back to a full five days a week uh, masks being optional the superintendent also adds I don't think it's the school's role to encourage or discourage COVID vaccinations it's a parent's choice it is it's a medical decision right I hope that we can we can follow uh, this uh, this school, I think it I think it would accommodate everyone. Um, you know, the one thing that I've noticed uh, with these babies, our kids, our babies, is that uh, the high level of fear, the anxiety, the depression, and the language barrier that they're suffering. Uh, I dropped my, my grandbaby off to her first day of school this year. Uh, she goes to uh, First Christian. And, uh, you know, I, I couldn't help but to think about all the scary things going on in her mind. 
and, and with, without being able to communicate with her teacher uh, left me really sad. I uh, figured we'd get through the rest of the year and make, make decisions based on what we decide here together. Um, The vaccine mandates. I've noticed that there's, there seems to be a lot of uh, a lot of push for those vaccines, and 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 it's, I, I work in the medical field, so in some ways I get it, and others I don't. I was contacted by the health department. Uh, a letter was sent to my daughter, my 16-year-old minor daughter, addressed to her, not to me, not to her parents, but to my minor daughter, uh, and. <laughs> telling her how safe and effective the vaccine was. Um, my daughter uh, has had seizures from vaccination. She's, she's exempt. But I, I guess I was sad to, uh, to, that, I, that I couldn't figure out why a minor child was getting mail. There was no, there was no warning on there about myocarditis, any side effect. Any, anything that I would want my daughter to know that I would teach her myself. Uh, just a letter to my minor daughter that it was safe, that she should get it. Um, and, I, and I think about the clinics that were in the high schools. You know, there was a survey that came out to ask us how we felt about them being there. Uh, two days later, it was gone. It disappeared. It was completely gone. I'm not sure anyone, I think, I think, I think there was a plan to move it into the high school whether we felt like it was the right thing to do or not. But my thing with that is with the, the pharmacies and, and Walmart and the doctors and every place that is offering this vaccination right now, there's, there's a place to get it. I don't feel that it belongs in the school. Um, I'm also a graduate of North. My, my, my parents uh, both graduated, my son graduated and went on to graduate from IU. Um, I am in a, in a position right now where I'm trying to decide what's best for my daughter. Uh, I, I've told her uh, she, she's working now. She just turned 16. Um, she, had, she, has one, she had one thing to do this summer. That was to find a job and to find a job where she could be free-faced. Okay, she found one. I'm, I'm anxiously awaiting what we can all decide together here. Uh, you know, if... if if uh, vaccines and masks cannot be a personal choice, if we cannot decide as parents what's best for our children, we, are, we will just consider moving to private school or homeschool. Um, a lot of people feel that way. I mean, a lot of people are over it, but I mean, we're looking at statistics now, and statistics are saying that, uh, that uh, you know, masks really haven't, haven't worked. They're not, they're not doing what they thought they would, so. Um, Ms. Johnson, I don't mean to be rude, but could you summarize what you need to say? I will. We have a dozen other people from whom to speak. Okay. I also want to encourage parents to look into the BCSC website at bcscschools.org. I want you to get familiar with a new curriculum that's being introduced in the upcoming school year and decide whether you think it's best for your children. Uh, I believe we need to come together as a whole body and do what's best for all of our children which is keep medical decisions in the home and eliminate masks. But check into that for me. And I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Kelly Whaler. Hi there. Um, Kelly Wheeler, my address is on the sign-in sheet. Or you can Google it. Um, <laughs> thank you, school board members. Thank you for representing the community, its citizens and students. You are the community's voice, and we have elected you as a governing body to hear our voice and speak upon our behalf. But we as caregivers and parents are also our children's voice. We are their biggest advocate, and they are our responsibility. I advocate for my son 24 seven. He has special needs, he's 10, he has Down syndrome. Nobody is more aware of what it takes than a parent with a child that has special needs. Um, our children's health, safety, and education is ultimately our responsibility, and you are our means by which to communicate their needs 
to the schools seven hours a day, five days a week, 180 days a year. Um, Governor Holcomb's last emergency order declared that decisions on masks for the upcoming year would be left to the school boards. I need to know who is going to make the decision for the upcoming year. Whose input will the school board take into account? Will the science documenting the necessity and safety of masking children, along with the other COVID guidelines, be provided to parents and caregivers? And let me just state for the record, I did not make my son wear a mask all of the school year. I refused. It's my choice. He's my child. He does what I say. Not a school board, not a task force. My husband and I chose that for him. He didn't get COVID. We didn't get COVID. We're COVID free, all of us. Everybody in my family that wore a mask religiously all got COVID. So there you go. I do not feel that um, the correct answer to any of the questions is we are just following orders. Our children deserve better than that. They just do. Um, as Megan stated, Center Grove and Westfield have already announced that mask wearing will be up to the individual, a choice given to the parents and caregivers of these children. Nationwide, parents and caregivers have been voicing their concerns over the beginning of another school year with mask mandates for children. BCSE students, especially K through six, deserve to have their parents and caregivers make their health choices for them. Nobody else. Nobody made health decisions for your kids when they were in the third grade. A faceless task force or teachers union should not be making health decisions for my child. That, again, is my job. Please do not relinquish or fail to exercise the authority that has been assigned through statute to be the representative body for citizens in all matters related to programs and operations. Do not default this important decision to an appointed committee or doctor. Please represent us, the citizens, the community, and put our children first. Now, I will say, taking temperatures has been a blessing. Too many parents send their kids to school sick. My child's in the doctor's office every eight to 12 weeks because too many kids are at school sick. He has a compromised immune system. So am I crazy for sending him to school without a mask? I don't think so. It's the chance I'm willing to take. I'm his mom. Now, everybody else that sends their kids to school sick, guess what? Everybody suddenly cares about everybody's health, and it's all of our duties to worry about everybody else. Well, it is, but people don't. They just don't. We all know, we've all sent a kid to school a little sniffly, maybe a fever of 99, and all of a sudden, everybody cares. It's my responsibility to make sure everybody feels safe and protected, and it's really not. My job is to make sure my son and his needs are being met. That's all I got. Thanks. Thank you. Sarah Huff. My name is Sarah Huff. My address is on the sign-in sheet there. I'm here because I am the mother of three wonderful little boys who go to BCSE. I reiterate what parents have said. I am responsible for my children. They are my responsibility their health, their safety, their education, and their emotional well-being is my responsibility. But in order for me to do what I think is best for them, I have to have a freedom of choice. I have to have a freedom of choice to send them in a mask or not for the upcoming school year. But in order for me to have that choice, I believe that the school board needs to assure me that you have all the pertinent information before you make that decision. So with that, I wanna talk about the ESSER three grant and what conditions come with that funding. I know there's an agenda item tonight to vote on this grant for $13.8 million over the next three years, which equates to about $400 per student per year. So the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund is designed to tackle learning loss and achieve operational efficiencies, but it comes with conditions. 
according to the SR3 overview pre presentation found on the Indiana Department of Education's website, local educational agencies must include how it meets CDC guidance to the extent practicable regarding the following, universal and correct mask wearing, physical distancing and contact tracing, along with other qualifications. So the CDC and the IDH have both put out other guidelines, and somebody's already spoke about that, the vaccination flow. What that will do is it will create a segregated environment in our schools. Yeah. And your vaccination status will be apparent to everybody else if you're wearing a mask or if you're not. And our children under 12 have no option, none. They'll be required until the vaccine is released for them if it's safe enough. So I think, it's, I think it's ironic that we're seeking funding to close a learning gap that was caused by health policies that we will continue to be subject to if we accept the ESSER three grant funding. Policies, those policies have been proven in multiple studies to be ineffective for stopping or slowing the spread of COVID-19. So I, I understand that the Department of Education held a meeting on Friday, June 4th, to start communicating the requirements of the ESSER three school uh, grants to the school. So I need to know, for full transparency, did BCSE participate? Was the board present for that meeting? Does the board fully understand the implications of BCSE accepting the ESSER three grant and how it might restrict your ability to make decisions regarding in-person learning for the next three years? Will all of that be explained in today's presentation on the grant, which is up for approval, I do believe. I, so I am asking you to delay voting or approval, proving anything on that grant until after the school board makes their decision and they can take all the information into account. So I mean, school board, after July 1st, where have we heard it's your responsibility for implementing measures and restrictions deemed necessary and prudent with regards to in-person learning. So is $400 per student worth giving up that responsibility of the decision to do what's best for our students for the next three years? So I just ask that you would give families the freedom to choose what is best for their children by making an informed decision. And if all of that's really hard to remember, just remember, don't get in a pickle for a couple of nickels. So for clarification, I can't decide if this person crossed their name out or not. Jessica Manuel? Okay. Thank you. Um, Tracy West. Hello, board. Thank you for letting me speak today. Um, my name is Tracy, like you said. Um, I have three sons, two of which attend a BCSE school. And I will say that we love our school. We love our school so much. The teachers are amazing. If it wasn't for, excuse me, I'm getting emotional. If it wasn't for all the extra effort that the teachers had put into this school year, we would not be here. We would not be part of the BCSE program. Um, with that being said, there are two things I want to talk about tonight. The first being that I am here for parent choice. I think, it's, I think it's very important that the parents have a choice in what goes on in the school. We are the parents, and that is the first thing. When it comes to the mask, I think we should be able to decide. The second reason I'm here is for my son. Um, he, right now, is playing uh, in a semifinal baseball game. That's why I'm wearing this shirt. <laughs> he is obsessed with baseball. He loves baseball. He wants to do everything baseball, play every night, practice, play video games, watch it on TV. You get the point. He loves baseball. So I talked to him and was letting him know I have a hard decision to make. Um, I can come to the BCSC board and tell them, you know, I want to have a choice, you know, to whether or not mask my child. I, he, and he understands that. He gets it. Or I can come to your game, which will probably be your last game of the year. 
And he said, Mom, I want you to go to that school board and look them, look them in the eye and tell them, I don't want to wear a mask next year. I don't want to do it. And I said, you're right. You're right. I'm going to go to the board, and I'm going to tell them that you don't want to wear a mask. I am up here. Sorry about this. I am up here for all the parents who are too scared to get up here. As you can tell, I am a little bit. Um, I'm up here for the students who can't speak out. They can't, they can't come up here and do this. I'm here for the rights of the parents so they should be able to decide what is best for their families. And each family is different. We all know that. I'm here because I want to make masks optional going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Ian McGiffin. Did I do that right? That's great. Awesome. Hello. Um, my name is Ian McGiffin uh, from Hartsville area. I've um, been here working for Cummins since 2009. Um, I'm speaking as a father of three children, um, a daughter age four whose birthday is actually today, um, yet my wife and I are here. Um, also two boys ages six and nine um, that attend Rock Creek Elementary and as an uncle of three nephews and four nieces who are also in the uh, Bartholomew County School District. Um, a little bit of educational background is I'm a mechanical engineer, um, so the science and statistics of the pandemic are something that, that interests me and something that I've studied um, fairly extensively. Both the lab studies for mask materials, for example, as well as real world studies on whether masks work for past studies like the flu and that sort of thing in a real world setting where you have lots and lots of noise factors that are not controlled. Um, so I'll just cut to the chase and give you my conclusion is that masks do not work as controlling an airborne virus. Um, we're not talking, it's, it's not a bacteria particle that's 10 times larger than a virus. Um, we are talking about a virus here and so the filter media does matter and therefore the cloth masks that most of our children are wearing. Um, are as effectively equivalent to trying to catch mosquitoes with um, a fence, a, a chain link fence. Um, the CDC states that viruses such as the flu, or they finally came around on COVID-19, are primarily transmitted um, via airborne transmission. Uh, these are also called aerosol droplets, and it basically are water particles that are so small that they stay in the air for hours and are inhaled and then infect said person. Um, so like I said, whether you're a mechanic or a teacher, we all know that we have to have the right tool for the job, right? And cloth masks especially are not the right tool for the job. Uh, if you want the numbers, looking at lab studies of filter efficiencies for various mask materials um, that don't even consider the leak, large leak paths around the top of your mask that you are can put your finger in probably the mask that you're wearing. Um, if not considering that, passing all the air through the filter media, cloth masks filter less than 10% of particles three times larger than a virus particle. A virus particle is roughly 0.1 microns, and the smallest that they measure mask materials at from a filter media standpoint are 0.3 microns and a cloth mask will catch less than 10% of those particles. So, what, so you might say, well, what's the downside of wearing a mask? It can't hurt, right? Well, actually it can. Um, prolonged mask wearing, my biggest concern is bacterial growth inside the mask. Um, my youngest son, six-year-old kindergarten, would come home with a wet mask because he would lick it and stick it in his mouth and chew holes through it, literally. Um, and so what is that doing? That's, that is a warm, moist environment, perfect for bacterial growth. Uh, what about, and how often are these masks being washed? Uh, my wife does a great job, wash them every day, right? But, are all kids subjected to that? I, I would say not. Um, 
Some of the side effects that studies have done on masks um, are irritability, headache, difficulty concentrating, um, reluctance to go to school, impaired learning, drowsiness, fatigue. That was from a, a university in Germany. Um, another one of my bigger concerns that have already been mentioned is verbal and nonverbal communication. Um, we're impeding the learning of those skills um, early in, their, in a child's development. And then now that the Indiana mask mandate has been removed um, for a couple months now, you have kids out, family get-togethers, playing with other children, going to church services where masks are no longer mandated, going to restaurants, maybe shopping. Um, so what message are we sending to our children if they're doing all those things outside of school and we send them to school and tell them, hey, you have to wear a mask? Are they, are they going to think that school is no longer a safe place? Um, especially kindergartners, right, who are already scared, and now you tell them, go to school, and oh, when you go to school, you have to wear a mask, even though you don't do it any other time. Um, so I guess the other question I tried to answer is, who are we trying to protect? COVID-19 presents a very low risk to our children the survival rate is 99.97% of children that have been infected that live through that infection. Children five to 14 years old, per a study from the timeline of March to July of 2020, looked at the death rate between COVID-19 and the flu. And children in this five to 14 year old age group were three and a half times more likely to die from the flu. Think about that March to July time frame. That was a peak time in the pandemic, and that's not even a peak time for the flu virus. So let's say that we're afraid of kids spreading it to adults at school. Um, so maybe I, or there's been some rumors that BC is considering uh, mandating masks based on the percent of residents vaccinated, which as of June 13th in Bartholomew County was 47%. So my thought to that is the adults who want to be vaccinated have had ample time, or we still have two months until school starts, so they have ample time to become vaccinated if that is something that they're worried about. We shouldn't be penalizing our students um, to basically try to meet metrics of percent vaccinated in Bartholomew County. Metrics aren't important. What's important is our children. It, let's say we would go down that path though and that you would say, well, we're gonna mandate masks until we get to X percentage vaccinated. Well, what is that percentage? And what is the science behind whatever number you would come up with. The answer is there would be no science. And maybe somebody would say, well, we're trying to get to a percentage for herd immunity. Well, my question to that would be, yes, we have 47% vaccinated, but what percent do we have naturally immune because they've had the virus? That would not be included in your metric that you're trying to get to to allow us to remove masks from our children. So in conclusion, I believe that masks are not an effective control measure against controlling the spread of an airborne virus such as COVID-19 or the flu. I know that it's my opinion and others may feel differently. Therefore, all I'm requesting is that you allow the parents the freedom to choose whether our true children are required to wear a mask for the upcoming school year or not. Thank you. Misty Hunter. Hello, my name is Misty Hunter. Thank you for hearing us tonight. Um, can I ask you to do do it a little bit closer to your mouth? Sure. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Good for me to say, okay. but I'm not good at it. But yes, yeah, so we could hear you better. Okay, thank you. Um, I will preface this with my family and I just flew in at noon today after an all-night flight, so um, I'm not as prepared as I'd like to with my comments, so I'll just take a minute. 
and let other parents that are, but I thought, my husband and I think it's important to be here um, because there's nothing more important to us than the well-being of our children. Uh, we have four, three who have been through BCSC and one who currently is still here. And I think it's important that you know from her perspective what she experienced with the mass this past year. Uh, it was a struggle for her. She's a straight A, B student and it got to the point where every day when she came home, we had Advil and water in the car when we picked her up because she had daily headaches from it. Some of her grades dropped and I think that is in part because of the mask and the focus and the uh, physical effects that it had on her. And I think that's something you should take into consideration if you are thinking about what's best for our children in their educational environment. Thank you. Thank you. Amy Menifee. Hello, um, I'm Amy Menifee. Um, I'm here today to both thank the board for the thoughtful decisions made during the 2019-2020 school year that prioritized parental choice for their child's education and to ask the board to apply the same consideration of parental choice concerning mask use and vaccination decisions. I ask that the board only require optional mask use for all BCSC students for the upcoming school year. I felt the need to speak today after seeing the recent ISDH recommendations. The recommendation to mask based on vaccine status is not only discriminatory, but it can also be interpreted as an intimidation tactic to pressure parents to vaccinate their children. <laughs> These recommendations by ISDH are highly questionable given that the vaccine has only recently been authorized by the FDA for emergency use only in ages over 12. We also have the knowledge now that the risk of having serious illness or complications from COVID in all school-aged children is extremely low. What we do not have any knowledge of or data collected about is the long-term or even short-term risk of the COVID-19 vaccine in children. As parents, we should not be forced, coerced, or pressured to give our children an untested or briefly tested experimental vaccine. Um, mask requirements based on vaccination status will create a bullying environment for the children in our schools. Having an optional face mask policy will allow for all to do what they feel most comfortable doing for their child. Our society is opening back up and masks are being worn less and less in all other areas of our children's lives. To enforce stricter mask policies in their schools than any other public place is not only unreasonable, it is also unscientific. It is time to acknowledge the facts and to change course from all the fear we had over the last year before we had the knowledge of how dangerous this disease could be for our children. I ask you, when you consider the plans for the next year, that you make parent choice for their child the guideline to follow. Thank you. Thank you. Devin Hunter. I'll just be real quick. Um, first of all, I want to thank the board for all the work that you guys do, but uh, every comment that I was going to make has been made tonight with the exception of thanking all of the people for being here tonight. Um, your comments were, you know, extraordinary. So thank you very much. Thank you. William Reed. So, uh, yeah, my name is William Reed, Elizabethtown, Indiana. I had actually planned on uh, two topics this evening, but I don't think I need to on the first one. Um, so, largely agree with everything that I've heard. Um, I'm over the fear. 
Um, fear is not, uh, not one of my values. It's not an American value. We don't need that. Um, so we'll get into subject two, which hopefully won't take too long here. Uh, raising kids well and educating them is a responsibility that comes with the job of parenthood. To facilitate that education, parents and parent communities work together to provide education options. Locally, we have very successful home schools, private schools, and public schools. Personally, my kids attend Rock Creek, Ian, go Bulldogs. And uh, I've been very happy with the collaboration that we have with the teachers and the administration there. In my family, we teach our children that they're accountable for their actions and their outcomes, to be respectful of others, especially their teachers, and we expect them to create more in life than they consume. Late in the school year, my kids came home with a sheet about social and emotional learning. It contained a very general overview and asked them to wear green on a particular day in support of SEL. I had not heard of SEL and was put back that my kids would be asked to support something that I wasn't aware of or knew if my wife and I would support. As we educated ourselves, it didn't take long to realize that SEL delves into areas that are the sole property of families to decide. Morals and beliefs are not things to be impressed on youngsters by a government agency or non-government organization. <laughs> SEL organizations clearly state their goals in rewriting norms, right and wrong, so-called equity, and revising our moral beliefs. Further reading on SEL led me to its tie into critical race theory. CRT is a politically motivated idea and one of the ugliest and most divisive concepts I've learned of. It serves to propagate racism, classism, and division. America is not a place for any of that and it should have no place in our public schools. In conclusion, my wife and I are opposed to SEL and CRT. I'm very interested to hear from the board on how you plan to keep our taxpayer-funded classrooms clear of this political re-education. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Hunter, or Mr. Reed, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, Christian Schofner. Good evening, I'm Kirsten Schofner. Um, that was a nice breath of fresh air, not talking about masks, pun intended, but um, sorry, good to go back to that. Um, one year ago, my heart sank, along with many others, as we got the news that our children would have to be masked for the 2021 school year. I was forced to make an uncomfortable decision, just like everybody else. I either keep my kids home mask-free, or I send them in a mask, hoping it won't last a full school year. Well, it did. I was often confused and frustrated when my kids would tell me that they were to keep masks on the entire day besides at recess. This confused me since recess is where more classrooms are all together in one area, breathing heavily on each other while playing games. Don't get me wrong, I was happy that they were unmasked outside, but didn't it just undo everything they just did inside while being masked at their seats? I was also very upset as I saw my two kids get off the bus with sweat spots on their clothes, bright red cheeks, and were both fatigued from the heat and lack of oxygen. Being on a bus with no air conditioning for an hour is bad enough, but then, with a mask on, it is unacceptable. There have been private schools across the country who did not mandate masks and gave the option to the parents. These schools have similar statistics as the schools who man mandated masks. This is great news, in my opinion. As of now, people have had the chance to get the vaccine if they choose to. Therefore, teachers and staff members are not being forced in a dangerous situation by working at a BCSE facility. This means we should be able to feel comfortable about leaving the masks as a choice for parents. If parents are not comfortable sending their kids to school with children not masked, then they also have the choice to online school. Please allow the parents who love their children more than anyone else to choose what's best for them. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon Brubaker. Uh, 
uh, here. Do you mind sharing your address? You did not put it okay. on here. Thank 12, you. 1230 South, 850 West. Thank you. Okay, hello, my name is Sharon Brubaker. And um, I'm actually here on behalf of my daughter. She wanted to be here tonight to make a speech, but couldn't make it. She and her husband both would have liked to have been here. Um, I also, though, I have five grandchildren that attend BCSE schools, so I'm kind of speaking on their behalf as well. Um, she sent me a message that she had a little speech prepared, so I'm just going to simply read what she had to say. Uh, she said, hello, I have two children who attend schools in BCSC and I'm also an employee of BCSC. Based on what I have seen and heard from my fellow employees and parents, I am fairly certain that the majority of BCSC students will spend their summers unmasked, um, playing, playing with friends, participating in sports, going to family gatherings. The majority of BCSC students will not get sick this summer. But if they do, their parents will make a decision on how to handle the sickness. Parents don't turn to the school board when deciding if they need to take their children to the doctor. Parents don't turn to the school board when deciding if a trip to the ER is necessary. And parents don't turn to the school board to make any medical decisions for their children. This is no different. The school board should not be dictating our children's health needs. If you have provided accommodations and options for those students and families who are not comfortable sending their children back to an in-person learning, a decision that these individuals made or will be making because they feel that is what is right for them. It is time you provide the rest of us with options as well. The options to unmask our children and allow us as parents to decide what is in the best interest and health of our children. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Eric Strevel. Hello, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, all the comments and everything that I had prepared myself to speak about tonight, I found about the, out about this meeting a short notice, so I thought I had been well prepared, but it has been far better articulated by these ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as I'm one of the last speakers, I'm, I'm fortunate and able to benefit from that. One thing I guess I would like to comment on is uh, what I noticed in the opening remarks, I believe it was uh, Dr. Shedd that made them. As we've gone through all this with COVID and the masks, one thing we do tend to forget is your remarks were based upon collectivism, the group, how we've all come together. I feel like the individual liberties and rights of the parents and or the children that we're speaking of have been lost in that. I, I'm not a scientist. My degree is in history. And I've, as you go through history, you see the very same tactics of separating people. Okay, we're going we're gonna, to, as one person put, shame one group into doing what we want by marking them, making them wear a mask or a star of David or a yellow armband, whatever it takes. Uh, I think what I'm trying to say here is that uh, Chairman Mao would be very proud of how things are being done. Oh, and also with the curriculum that this gentleman was speaking of, I've had my head in the sand like a lot of parents have for a long time. Our eyes are starting to open on, on this stuff. This is my first school board meeting. I've got four kids in the system. Two of them are through it. I've got two left, but it will not be my last. Thank you. Amy Strevel. Yes, we're married, and we didn't we didn't talk a lot beforehand, so we have different um, remarks. Um, I'm very much in support of dropping a mask mandate. These are now for show. They've been for show for the last two years. They don't a or a year and a half. They don't accomplish anything, and we, those who have looked at the CDC 
and Dr. Fauci in those remarks realize that their stance on masks has flip-flopped thousands, a <laughs> hundred times. And there has been no consistency. And in the end, they're not effective. I, we have four children. We have one that's still at Southside. We love Southside. The teachers are fabulous. And um, we're so excited um, to have Andrew return for another year. This past year, Andrew lost 20 in-person school days, 20, to close contact reporting. Okay, the second time he was quarantined, he had apparently been in contact with a student on, or a teacher, one or the other, on Tuesday. He attended school the remainder of the week. He went to piano lessons. He went to a class party at Urban Air in Franklin on Saturday with all those same people. He went back to school on Monday. We got him all up and ready. And then on Monday morning, he was sent home. Does anybody follow that logic? Now I understand that there's testing and testing takes time, but we need to rethink this process. We really need to rethink this process. These kids are in contact with one another. First of all, they're not, as somebody said, what are we protecting them from? If he was uh, exposed to someone with COVID, I, I'd be more concerned if he was exposed to someone with the flu because COVID presents very little risk to him at all. Um, for all I know, because his symptoms could have been very mild, he may have already had it. So we don't really know. Um, I, I just, that is one of my concerns going forward is that we revisit this um, quarantine process. Um, I am just gonna quickly review, um, make sure that there's nothing that I wanted to say that hasn't already, um, I did want to point out as well the other thing that um, when we talk about the vaccine versus not vaccinated, if we were to separate people on that basis, we do know that vaccinated people are still getting COVID, right? Do we, oh, every time you look at the, the news, you open it up and says, five people that were vaccinated are now positive. The, um, the vaccine wasn't intended to eliminate people from being able to get infected. It was to reduce the severity of symptoms. So breaking people up according to this criteria really makes no sense at all. So, um, just if you would keep those things in mind, and the very last comment I want to make, and I already touched on once, is the school board in general using the CDC and the Indiana Department of Health. I know we've turned to these organizations as the knowledge base for how we make decisions. But I think a lot of Americans and a lot of people in this community realize that um, they have, um, they've been a disappointment to many throughout this pandemic, have not provided clear guidance, and it seems that at times they've had ulterior motives. So. And Eric and I are the same address. Did we give that to you? No, you didn't. But... 3997 Jonathan Ridge. Okay, thank you very much. Columbus 47201. Thank you, school board and All Dr. Right. Roberts. And thank you. All of you. I appreciate it. 
That does end the list of individuals who've signed up for comments. I can, I think I'll speak for our, my colleagues. I appreciate the time that you took to be here, the time and research that you did, and the comments that you shared. Um, as we have alluded to already, we've got a lot of thinking to do from now until uh, July, and all of your input has been very, very important and helpful to us. So thank you very much for taking the time. We will move on to the rest of our agenda. Thank you. The next item is board commendations, I think. Yes, it is. So I know Mr. Grimes has some, so we'll let him start, all right? Okay, so I have a, uh, I have a handful of commendations here, and I'll try to go uh, fairly quickly. But uh, first off, uh, congratulations to Columbus North uh, student Hannah Franklin for earning a scholarship from the Indiana Commission of Higher Education, $7,500 a year up to a total benefit of $30,000. She is part of the fifth class of next generation Hoosier educators. Uh, secondly, um, C4 continues to do, just seems like all kinds of great things and was just recently presented an award by the Indiana Governor's Workforce Cabinet uh, for their excellence in business community partnerships. And about 900 BCSC students um, each year have a chance to tour local businesses um, to learn more about various careers in conjunction with a course that they take called uh, Preparing for College and Careers. Um, Next one has to do with students. Um, just kind of out of my own curiosity, um, on May 19th, I had the opportunity to go to Columbus East and witness some senior project presentations. And I'll, I'll just mention real quickly the three students from East whose presentations that I, that I saw that were um, very impressive. And um, I, I think it's probably safe to say my kind of preconceived notions of, of senior projects and what all they entailed changed significantly as a result of my visit. But uh, the first one I heard, T.J. Barkheimer, who is working on um, his private pilot's license. I think T.J. took his first lessons in Greenwood at the 1st of October and made his first solo flight from Greenwood to Terre Haute by the middle of February. And TJ plans to go to Indiana State and wants to be a um, cargo pilot at some point. Uh, another one I heard, Ethan Glade. Um, Ethan, who plans to go to the IU Kelly School of Business and study accounting, um, was the online editor of East's student newspaper, The Oracle, and um, came up with all kinds of creative ways um, during this last year to help continue raising funds to, to support that publication. And then lastly, um, Shaylee Derringer, who plans to go to school to become a psychologist, and uh, she organized a uh, cleaning fundraising for, for the Crump, which, um, yeah, all very, all very impressive and uh, enlightening. Uh, the last two I want to share have to do with teachers. Um, CSA Lincoln teacher, uh, Mrs. Brittany Mahoney, who, uh, well, it's not brand new anymore, but through the Heritage Fund, um, was the 2021 recipient of the Bill and Sa Sally Henley Excellence in Teaching Award. Um, Mrs. Mahoney, only a fourth year teacher. I mean, she, I get the impression she does anything and everything under the sun to pique kids' interests in education from you know, setting up a Jurassic Park type atmosphere to coming dressed as a stormtrooper to teach new, um, oh, math concepts, all kinds of things. And Mrs. Mahoney commented that uh, going above and beyond is simply the CSA Lincoln way. Yeah. And then lastly, um, uh, Mrs. Peggy Myers, a uh, special ed teacher at Columbus East, uh, who just, uh, received the 2021 Edna Folger Outstanding Teacher Award that goes to any Bartholomew County uh, teacher, K through 12, uh, elementary, secondary, public, private, parochial, and 
Uh, Mrs. Myers um, not only teaches, her students run the coffee cart at Columbus East. She um, founded the Best Buddies program at East uh, as a unified track coach at East. And then um, she was actually nominated by a former East student who was inspired by seeing her in action, who is currently at Ball State and plans to major in special ed as, as you know, what she witnessed um, from her days at East, seeing Mrs. Myers in action. That concludes mine. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome, thank you very much. Are there other commendations to be shared? I have one. Thank you, Dr. Bill. So congratulations to Columbus North High School Band. It's a, they were a recipient of the Indiana State School Music Association All Music Award for the 2021 20, school year. The Indiana State School Music Association may have already presented the band with a special banner um, to display in recognition of these outstanding achievements. So congratulations to the band, the musicians, the music staff, and everyone who is part of this um, great award. Thank you, Dr. Bill. So there are others? All right, I'll move on to school board member reports. There. Yeah, I've got two quick ones. All right. Um, on May 25th, um, I met with the uh, High Ability Broad Based Planning Committee, um, focused on a few things. Um, one, the uh, blinded identification of students for the program that began in school year 1920. Um, is, is alive and well and uh, is, is a process that the committee continues uh, or plans to continue. Um, they talked about updating their website to include testimonials um, about, about the program. Um, looking, you know, continuing to look for ways to create more uniform uh, information going out to schools to create more consistency in an effort to be as transparent as possible. And um, then lastly, uh, there was continued discussion on how to best meet the needs of high ability learners uh, that remain in general education classrooms. And then lastly, um, on June 1st, the school foundation uh, had a strategic planning s session uh, where we looked at the, ninth, or at the 2021 budget proposal and first quarter financial activity and started discussion um, in terms of setting some strategic uh, objectives to focus on over the next few years with a particular emphasis on ways to increase community awareness of the school foundation um, in an attempt to broaden and grow um, its revenue base for continued sustainability. Awesome, thank you. Uh, am, I read, am I reading eyes well enough, Nikki? <laughs> Did you have comments? Uh, I'll just say from the Redevelopment Commission, um, you know, there's so much work looking at revitalizing downtown, which is really exciting. I will say the garage has reopened under new leadership. So, you know, at times like this, we are dependent on each other and those businesses need your, your patronage. So, so try, to, try to support them. Also say some may have read Sarah Cannon has passed away. She led the Redevelopment Commission, a great loss for our community. She served in, in many, many ways. I think there's a celebration of life um, this week to recognize her, so please keep Keep everyone in thoughts and prayers. That's it. Thank you for that. Are there others? We did have a diversity council meeting in May, um, and it was also strategic planning <laughs> meeting, much like yours, Mr. Grimes, and um, trying to determine, really kind of go back and determine the purpose, the vision of the diversity council, do we want to be an advisory board? Do we want to be an action board? What do we want to do? And um, of course, we did go over the groups that are part of the diversity council, such as the underrepresented teacher and family academic achievement and the different uh, groups. 
So our, um, we're going to continue to look at that, look at our plan, and hopefully um, figure out a direction that we want the Diversity Council to go into, whether that's advisory, whether that's action, or something else, or a little of both. But um, the Diversity Council has been around for a really long time, which I wasn't really aware of, uh, around like 20 years or something. So, um, but we, you know, it's always good to relook at purpose and mission and uh, values and those kind of things every once in a while to uh, figure out are we still on the right path? Do we need to switch? <sighs> do we need to take a different path? What do we need to do? So that was what our. Diversity Council consisted of in May, Dr. Shedd. All right, thank you so much. I will just share with you, um, my colleagues, I participated in the exit report meeting that we had this afternoon um, from our, uh, the audit of our State Board of Accounts. Um, the meeting went well. You as board members will get uh, a little more information and then that final report will be public at the end of July on the Board of Accounts website. So uh, we can share more information as it becomes more public. All right, cabinet reports and Mr. Phillips, you're first on the list. Thank you, Dr. Shedd. Good evening. This is the semi-annual extracurricular account report. Um, this is just a school by school accounting of the beginning balance for this last semester, uh, the receipts, expenditures, and ending balance. Uh, big picture, as you would expect, we continue to uh, both receipt and spend less money um, in this last semester uh, due to COVID restrictions. Um, about 50% reduction over the prior year, 50% less uh, receipts and 50% less expenditures, but um, basically the same balance then since both expenditures and receipts were, were offset by about 50%. Happy to answer any questions you might have. All right. Do individuals have questions? Okay, you're good to go. There's a proposal or comment report on support staff pay. Good evening. This, um, Mr. Phillips and I will be presenting a plan for some addressing the support pay adjustments that will go into effect July 1st. And when we're looking at the support staff, we're looking at any support staff members that fall on our matrix system of the different grades of employees. And who will this impact? It'll impact over 900 support staff employees. And I do want to be clear that this does not include administrators, teachers, or special contract employees. We will begin our formal um, contract uh, bar collective bargaining with our teachers in September. They'll conclude by November, and at that time we'll see that outcome and then come back to you with decisions made for administrators and special contract employees following those decisions. So at this time, we'll turn it over and tell you why we want to address the support staff matrix. Thank you. So the last time you, you may remember is 2016. I'm in charge of this, there we go. In 2016 uh, was the last time we addressed um, other than just uh, basically small 2% cost of living increases uh, for the support staff pay, that was the last time we looked at the entire schedule and said, uh, looked at, compared ourselves to other districts, each position compared to other districts across the state. Uh, this last uh, spring, we got invited to participate in a study across the entire state. We submitted data. As long as you submitted data, you got access to the metadata from all the districts in the state that participated. And there were about... Uh, 240 or so of the 290 districts that participated. So good feedback, good information. Um, the information gleaned from that generally said we lag behind both our local districts around us and peer districts um, in our support staff pay, hourly pay. Um, that in addition to the current labor market that we're experiencing that, that you're probably read about if you're not experiencing in your own professional life, um, and that classified staff survey is what I just referenced uh, the, 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 that we participated in this last spring. And then our opportunity, the reason why, the other reason we're able to do this now is thanks to the increase in per pupil uh, support from the state during this last budgetary session. That uh, increase in state per pupil state support hits starting July 15th. 
So the, the reason why now is because we can starting July 1 because that's when our increase starts. Customarily, we, we increase support staff pay after we finish with the collective bargaining process with the Teachers Association. But um, because of the information we had in front of us, the labor market, um, and the fact that we're staffing up for this fall, uh, we decided it was prudent to do this as soon as possible, get in place to start hiring folks for this, uh, this fall's school session. So uh, the what, what, what we're proposing is to change, adjust the entire scale. In 2016, uh, we went after specific positions, and, and certain positions were behind compared to our peers and across the state, generally looking at our entire scale. Every position has lagged behind just a little bit, and then as years go by, you know, that, that tends to grow if you don't keep up with increases. So our proposal is to increase the entire scale 9%. So every hourly support staff person um, would see an increase of 9%. Plus, on July 1 is when they move up um, on experience. So there's a, if you're familiar with our support staff grid, there are, there are positions that are the rows and columns that are your years of experience. So if, you, if you're a, a support staff employee who is above the scale, meaning they have more than 10 years of experience with us, they would see just the 9% increase, not a, uh, an increase for experience plus 9%. Um, so if we implement this on July 1, future increases will be guided by the increase um, from collective bargaining this fall that just wouldn't happen until next July 1. And so we wouldn't, we wouldn't do two increases within a few months of one another. We would kind of jumpstart our support staff by implementing an increase here on July 1 and then using the um, collective bargaining average increase that would guide our decisions around the support staff increases for July 1 of 2022. Um, and this has no impact on referendum increases. You remember all support staff, um, permanent support staff uh, have an, a dollar increase per hour from the referendum and bus drivers two dollars per hour increase from the referendum. This is what that scale looks like that I just described before. This is the current scale. Um, right now we the the lowest paid employees are on grade three and I think there's only uh, it might be food service substitutes are the only ones that are even on that row everyone else starting below that. So this is the current state um, starting at basically 980 at the lowest end and then 2487 at the highest end. And again, reminding you that there are a lot of support staff members, some of our most loyal and, and long lasting um, employees with us are above that 10. And so they would have received, you know, two, three, two and a half percent increases over the years that are beyond this scale. This is the proposed new scale. Again, it's just every line item. Um, times 1.09 for the 9%, but it moves that uh, line four to 1068 from the bottom um, from 980. And then the, the top end goes from 2487 to 2711. We have employees on every single cell that you see here. So um, plus those off of it. So it's a wide range of how it might affect each individual employee. And Dr. Pleak will go over some examples here in just a moment. Here is the estimated cost, um, annual cost of implementing this uh, from a fiscal year perspective from July through June of next year. The total cost about 1.8 million, but um, you know, you're, you're used to because I present and emphasize so much about the education fund and that's where the majority of our expenditures do come from. But in, when it comes to support staff, they're really funded from lots of different sources. So the impact on the education fund is about 650,000 per year. But the operations from the education fund, again, we do those transfers now, it's about 360. So the total impact on the education fund is about $1 million per year. Operations fund, 340. And then food service is a big portion of that um, at about 150,000. But um, she, uh, Nancy Millspaw, is one of the folks in our, our administrative group who's most adamant that we need to address this to in, uh, address her staffing for this fall. Um, and then other funds, that includes all those grant funds and, and all kinds of, uh, from special ed to Title I to Title IV to um, you know, all the other funds that support our support staff. So there's the, the total cost. We are able to um, accomplish this without affecting um, the money that's on the table for collective bargaining, 
or sacrificing any other initiatives that we plan as a district. Um, as a matter of fact, as we enter the strategic planning, you know, that we, we're participating up to this point and through this summer, um, doing this now basically says we value this as much, so much that we're, we're taking this and allocating it before we finish the collector or the, uh, the strategic planning process so we know we take care of this, um, this issue that we know is, is important for us. And as always, we know you're always very interested in the impact it has on individual groups and individuals. Chad showed you the overall support staff matrix, all the line items, and plus we have people beyond the matrix. And with that, we just want to show you the examples, the stories of the impact of a few employee groups. So this is just an example for of three positions, special education TA, administrative assistant, and bus driver, and the impact it would be. And if you'll see below the little disclaimer there, um, the examples based are on zero years of experience for the 2020-21 school year, and then with one year of experience going into this school year. So if they came with us last year, they're returning for this year, what the increase will be with a 9%. So um, you notice special education TA, $11.77. That is counting a $1 referendum increase to this year with the 9% increase, $12.96 an hour, and that still includes the $1 referendum. Administrative assistant, $15.20, which includes $1 referendum pay. And then it will go up to $16.79. Again, $1 referendum. That referendum dollar matters. And then the bus driver go from $19.67. They do have $2 on the hour based on referendum pay, and that will move them up to $21.62 with a 9% increase in the $2 referendum pay. So overall, the impact there for special education TA for a year is over $1,300 of income that will be coming home to them and their families. Administrative assistant, a little over $2,700, and a bus driver, a little over $1,400 a year. And that's all based on their days, hours, worked, and things like that. There could be some uh, exclusions if their days and hours may be slightly different than other groups, but that is a base generality of the experience. So we did want to give you a brief overview of the why, why we seek this is going to be important for us to be competitive in our market, give our students the best people to be able to recruit and retain the best employees. We're excited for this opportunity. We're excited we have the funding to be able to support this and we believe our employees deserve it. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there questions that colleagues might have while we have Mr. Phillips and Dr. Pleat? Yeah, I, I, do, I do have a question. Can you go back to the matrix, please? And this is just me learning the classifications roles. Can you? Can you sort of give me on a population basis how many people are at the top versus middle, low? Is it pretty even? Or is there a, a, you know, concentricity in one part of that matrix, if you will? Um, there is certainly some concentricity. The, the um, basically five to seven range mm -hmm. is going to be the largest group, and that's um, teaching assistants across. Um, we have a wide variety of types of teaching assistants, but generally they're going to be in that that five to seven range. Um, then there are probably the, I, I said largest group, and it could still be, but very close to that, throughout the middle is going to be administrative assistants, custodians. Um, Teresa, you can yell one out if I'm, if I'm missing. Uh, building technology specialists at the, at the, the beginning level. What did you say, uh, Ms. Heine? Yeah, so school nurses that are non RNs, the LPNs. So they're going to be in the middle section, and then they're the fewest people in the upper section, and those are going to be skilled trades, RNs, um, building uh, technology folks that are in more specialized positions um, than, than the general tech supports. Specialists. HR specialists. Right, the, the, um, the 260 day support, uh, payroll folks. Um, in this building that work 260 days doing financial and HR work are going to be in that. Bus drivers are that 16B line, so that's a pretty good uh, group of people as well, 100, 100 or so folks. Good. Thank that you. help? Yep, it does. It does. One, one more question. Do you guys feel like you understand how we got you know, so far behind maybe what, what some other districts were, were at? Was it something in our processes or... It's, it seemed like in the original statement that maybe we fell a little bit behind in, in some of our pay. I, I couldn't tell you exactly why other than the fact that um, some districts around us are faster growing, and so faster growing districts are going to 
um, you know, basically the amount of money we, we receive from the state is the number of kids times the formula amount. And so a district that, that increases in, in enrollment by 6% in a year is going to experience a lot of increase in revenue and be able to allocate that. Of course, there's increased demand on staff, but usually if you're big enough, um, there's economies of scale with that, that adding a few in a, in a place doesn't necessarily add a position and so you're allowed to increase. We're thankful that we are a very stable enrollment school and have been for, gosh, over, over a decade, that our growth is, is slow but steady um, and we very rarely experience any declines or, or f rapid increases that we have to react to. Um, probably the reason we, have, we don't build schools often here like other districts have to. Westfield, Washington mentioned often here. That's a district that would be exploding with growth, building schools, hiring staff, and competing in the Indianapolis market. Not necessarily things that we've had to do. Um, and so a combination of those things, very low uh, growth in revenues, very low growth in the number of students. Um, yeah, that's, that's a summary of where I would say we are. Just to kind of follow up on Ms. Wielden's questions, um, can you, looking back, can you identify a point in time when we started to realize, I mean, what initiated the study? Were we already having hiring issues when we started the study? In 2016, it was really one of Dr. Quick's outgoing, you know, he wanted to, um, as he left, he wanted to take care of as many things as he could. Um, and it was one of the things he said, let's address any issues we have with support staff and let me take care of that before I leave. And, and that was great and it reset and, and got us to at least where we were very competitive in most of our um, positions. Um, in between that time, basically if you, if you think about 2016 today and how the, the soon after 2016 is when you started seeing some of the, uh, you know, $350 signing bonus at Taco Bell and $60,000 pay here, um, those things just started to grow in the market. Um, we didn't initiate participation in this study. The, the group that organized it recognized the issue for all districts in the state and said, we will put this together. And as long as you participate and send us your data on each position and what you pay them, we will give you all the data back so that you can use it to evaluate where you are. Um, so it was, it was not until receiving that we realized how, uh, we knew we had some difficulty hiring in specific positions but not, didn't really have the realization that we were, um, we were lagging in, in, you know, broadly across all position types from a support staff perspective. And do you have any reason to believe we won't, with these changes, we won't be in good shape come the fall? Certainly can't guarantee anything, but I did ask um, Dr. Bozeman to check with his folks and, and, um, and Ms. Heine to say, if we were to do 9%, do your hiring managers feel like it's significant enough to make a difference in hiring folks? Because if it's not, let's look at it and make some changes. And uh, their response was, we think it's, it's adequate enough that it makes a significant enough difference, not only to hire, but to retain our folks that are saying, you know what? I, I, I think one of the quotes I got is, we have people leaving for a nickel. I will leave this position and go somewhere else for a, for a nickel on the, on the hour. And this helps us uh, you know, compete with in the market today. But, um, you know, depending on what happens with the market, we could be in a better position a month from now than we are now, and we could be in a worse position. Thank you. Are there other comments, questions? Thank you all very much. Okay, Dr. Roberts, we've got 4A through L. Do we have quite the list of uh, requests for approval for you, so I'll run through those. You can choose how to approach them. Uh, so we start with just the regular school board meeting, the minutes of, from May 10th. So that was the one prior to, to this one. A list of supplemental contracts provided to you, as well as field trips and professional leaves. Um, school fundraisers, a part of your packet, just a couple of those, I believe. Uh, from claims and payroll standpoint, we do have two sets of claims, one dated today and then a pre-run docket from the month of May. So June 14th, a little over $1.6 million the month of May, about $7.8 million in claims for your approval. Additionally, we have 
a few payrolls there from uh, March 29th. Um, change that date at the top to, let's see, to the June 4th pay actually. So it says April 11th there, and you change that to June 4th. That total is about $10 million. You look at May 7th, covers work days 412 to 423, normal payroll, May 21st, 426 to 57, normal payroll. May 27th, summer payoff option for 50 individuals. We do have individuals who will choose to take the summer pay in one chunk uh, versus having it spread out over the course of the summer. That's 44 teachers and six retirees. Um, then we have June 4th, covers work days May 10th to May 21st. It does include some COVID stipends that you approved as well as a half day pay for teachers. Uh, when they work that extra time to end and finish the school year when we had moved their final day to the beginning of the school year to um, start on August the 10th instead of August the 6th, I believe. And then we also have our stipends from the spring that are uh, appendices in our collective bargaining agreement from coaching and, and other, other responsibilities and duties. So a lot of different things covered uh, in those payrolls. Um, so the claims and payroll is a part of the request. Additionally, we have a dual language grant application. It's an annual uh, application that we uh, complete through the Indiana Department of Education. It uh, helps us with our legato, Spanish Immersion Academy at Clifton Creek Elementary School. Uh, ESSER 3 has been referenced already tonight, so the ESSER 3 grant application is up for your approval. We have a resolution for additional administrator days due to COVID-19, so as we have asked you throughout the course this year for stipends for uh, whether it be support staff or for our certified staff members, there are two days uh, requested for the additional time um, that has been put in from our administrator standpoint. So just asking for that approval to acknowledge that, that effort. Um, and then a resolution authorizing performance-based accreditation waiver. So that is a waiver that the state of Indiana has given us the option to pursue. Uh, specifically, we are asking for a time when it comes to that waiver. Uh, so your approval through a resolution is necessary for us to file the waiver with the State Board of Education. And in filing that waiver with the State Board of Education, we are pursuing flexibility in counting time. I referenced 180 instructional days, for example, earlier. That's a part of statute. But if we can count those days with hours and minutes um, versus just I came to school 180 times, uh, it gives us some flexibility in terms of how we can approach, whether it be professional development for our staff, um, learning time, uh, early, late, whatever that case might be and how it might change or impact the calendar. Uh, we would like for that flexibility and, and again it would it be something that we would have to actually file the application with the state board of education or excuse me the state board yeah state board of education we have not yet done that tonight we need to, your approval for a resolution we also have an addition of a pre-k classroom at l francis smith elementary school the department of education requires us if we change grade configuration in a building to have you first approve that so smith elementary school for example right now is a k through six building to make it a pre-k through six building add a classroom there we need your approval to then uh, submit that great configuration change. We also had some elementary course fees and secondary course fees uh, in your packet for 21 and 22, just some tweaks that, that were necessary following the textbook adoption and then going through all the fees that we have uh, that we request. I believe that is all before we jump into human resources recommendations. Um, Dr. Pleak, where are you? Might have you come up to the microphone here real quick. Just based upon the ESSER 3 questions that were raised earlier, just uh, I thought it'd be helpful for Dr. Pleak to provide you some additional information on the expenditures or requests for expenditures we would have under that application, anything um, about that application as it ties to the reopening of school. Dr. Pleak. The grant is due, the ESSER 3 grant at this time is due June 25th. The application opened up last week and um, all, all funds have to be encumbered by September 2024 and all, has, all funds have to be expended by December of 24. So we're like three years out and we're trying to predict the needs at this time. We all know that needs may change, things may arise, and at any time that we decide to go a different direction with any of the funding, as always with any other grant, you can do an amendment and amend the funds to be spent differently. And in the, what the parent mentioned tonight about the CDC guidance and things like that as mentioned in the presentation, that was very accurate information. and. Um, the phrase that I go on and all of that is to the extent practicable um, is something that is mentioned. And the whole basis between all of this funding that the government is wanting to make sure is we return to in-person learning. And so that is the biggest thing that they are focusing on is the reopening schools return to in-person learning and to follow the CDC guidance to the extent practicable, which Governor Holcomb has at this point, everything he does expires June 30th and the schools will begin formulating in July what we will be doing with our reopening. So I believe in our application that what we will put is we will follow the, 
the reopening guidance provided and adopted by the school board. Um, again, I'll use that phrase to the extent practical in all that we do. And just another reference, I know the first two grants that you approved on this, we called the CARES 1 and CARES 2, and it was ESSER 1, ESSER 2. There is a little bit difference here with the change in administration. This is called the American Rescue Plan, and it is ESSER 3. So there's a lot of confusing there. The, uh, the, the big requirement is 20% needs to be spent on learning loss. I can tell you we, none of us like the phrase of learning loss. Uh, so we're looking at accelerated learning and opportunities we can provide additional supports to our students during this time with this extra funding. And are there any specific questions that you have about what is laid out before you in the budget request or recommendation for approval? Dr. Pleak. Yes. So, and I just, I, you know, just want to just clarify. So let's say uh, at the July board meeting, um, the board do, does decide to go optional on the mask and with the vaccination, you know, just hypothetically throwing that out there, you know, would that have any effect on this grant? I can't determine the decisions that the IDOE we will make at that time. What we are is to be truthful and honest with what our plan is and what we think the best is for the reopening of our students. So, um, and I think there with that is the CDC may continue to change guidance. The last guidance was like April 23rd. There were some additions from the State Board of Health recently on recommendations, but again, that may change. And it may change by July, it may change by August, it may change. Um, so at that time, we just submit to what our plan is and we adjust as necessary. Okay, so we could go ahead and submit for the grant now, since it's due in June 25th, 11 days. So, and then that way, as we move forward, then whatever decisions that we make locally within our community, then at which point we would just send those adjustments per the grant up to him and say, we need to amend our grant because of the direction that we have decided to go in. Yeah, the, the main thing that the, the federal government is looking for is just every six months we give an update of what our current reopening plan is and if we are still in person instruction okay. with them, that is what they want to keep in place. And the other thing is to make sure that we are not reducing employees and that's been a part of every grant so far, CARES 1, CARES 2, and the American Rescue Plan. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I think one of the keys about this particular grant application, and, and maybe goes back to ESSER 1 and 2 as well, but is the focus on in-person learning, mm -hmm. which seems a little interesting for us because we've been in person for much of the year. That is not true for many places in the country. Um, some did not go back this entire year, so you have a grant application that is general in terms of focusing people on getting back to in-person we are already there so we can state that we are already in person and that we will then follow the um, uh, plan adopted by the board and if then it's not accepted we'll have that issue to deal with but Dr. Pleak did ask those specific questions in conversations to see how we could phrase the uh, the application given our circumstances and timing and the fact that we're already in person with school right thank you Other questions for Dr. Plee? All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Dr. Shedd, I just sure. realized this has got Dr. Plee's name next to it, too. It's a new topic. Uh, the classroom at uh, uh, oh, Smith. Smith. Uh, how will parents find out? And uh, is that, that's for this August. Um, will, will we have enough kids to make it worthwhile? It is a priority that we have enough kids to make it worthwhile. Um, we believe in the expansion of pre-K and we know many parents desire it to be at their elementary school and when it becomes feasible and manageable, we try to do that. And this year they had enough applicants that we make it feel like it's worthwhile to expand. And once parents know it is there and to stay, then they're much likely to commit. But parents have been informed um, through emails, letters and website and presentations by, by Mr. Yates, the director's uh, pre-K about the addition and the change. Thank you. Okay, you better sit down. <laughs> Not that you don't take all of our questions, we appreciate it. All right, if I followed Robert rules, we were first to motion the approval of 4A through L as they've been presented to us. So moved. 
Thank you, Ms. Tayhoff Dwyer. Is there a second? Second. second. All right, thank you, Mr. Bryant, Ms. Wilden. Um, are there additional questions regarding these items? I've got one quick one. Sure. How many elementaries have pre-K classrooms? Dr. Flick, what is it now? It gives us... I'm just sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, count back. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's all right. <laughs> Dr. Van Horn is <laughs> counting in his head back there, too. So it's eight buildings now that we would have. The, yeah, good question. Thank you. Any other questions before we vote on these items? All right, all of those who appro approve items 4A through L as they've been presented to us and clarified during this meeting, if you'd signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, Dr. Roberts, those have been approved. Thank you. Do I have to, Miss Heine? <laughs> This is our last time that we get to ask Ms. Heine for your um, recommendations for human resources. Thank you, Dr. Shedd. I'm requesting approval of the human re resource recommendations as presented this evening. Thank you. Do I have a motion for approval of those items as presented to us? Aye. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bryan. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Bills. Any particular questions for Ms. Heine? I, I, not about these recommendations in particular, but just in general, how's the recruitment and hiring process going? It's going well. It really has since the start. I think we're up around 92, maybe a few more yet this week, new hires. And that includes the CARES. Again, a certified staff member. We just had support sorry, staff yeah, conversation earlier, staff. so we have over 90 certified staff members hired. Yeah. Awesome. We will have a great new school year. Um, any other questions for Ms. Heine? All right, all of um, those who approve the human resources recommendations as presented to us, if you'd signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, Ms. Heine, thank you very much. We always try to end our meetings with opportunities for um, individual members to make comments uh, given the course of our meeting. So I'll ask Mr. Bryant. I just want to thank the uh, people for coming out and voicing their opinion, uh, reference to the mask. Uh, I too am part of this thing, but uh, it is something that I think is worthwhile right now at this particular time. So uh, thank you for voicing your opinion and uh, we'll take it into consideration. At least I will anyway. <laughs> thank you very much. Dr. Bills. Yeah, I, I agree with <clears throat> Mr. Bryant. I received your emails. Those of you who are still here and also emailed us and and I, I really understand the Last year, well, gosh, it's been over a year now. Um, it's been crazy, and you know we go back and forth and um, about what is good for everyone, you know, and and but also trying to balance that with um, rights and responsibilities, and it, it's it's a you know it's not an easy decision about when you're talking about making decisions for you know, entire school district. But I, I really do appreciate all of your emails and all your comments this evening. And um, I, I will take it under consideration and definitely look, I'm, a, I'm kind of a research sort of <clears throat> data kind of freak person. So I look at stuff like that all the time, the, the science and, and those kind of things. So that definitely is going to be part of it as uh, I consider you know what what will happen in July so again thanks so much for coming out and uh, and for you the emails expressing your interest parents you're you are important to the school corporation and you're part of this school corporation and and this and you should have a say in 
in um, many of the things we do in this district. So thanks again. Mr. Stenner. Yeah, I'd also like to thank the parents for coming out tonight and uh, the, all the communication that we got in advance of this meeting. Uh, I'm convinced that we'll make better decisions uh, the more we hear from our stakeholders. So I appreciate your voices. Thank you. Ms. Tay-Hoftwire. First, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Ms. Heine for her years of service with us. Uh, tonight is kind of her last deal uh, with us as she... <laughs> as Dr. Quick would say, right off into the sunset. Um, <laughs> and so I wish her the best. It's been a pleasure working with her and she has taught, I know myself and I'm sure many, uh, a lot of things about, you know, the hiring and human resource and just uh, bouncing things off, off, uh, you know, your, your mind and stuff. So I appreciate all of that. Secondly, I do want to thank everyone that is here and the correspondence that you have given. It is um, an important topic. I do feel the same way. I had uh, four kids go through BCSC and my two graduated in 2019, so they were not in school during the pandemic, but they were in uh, technical schools and, and uh, college. So, um, but I also had granddaughters and, you know, uh, nieces and nephews dealing with this. Um, I also have a son with special needs and do understand the concerns as far as those decisions are the parents. So I appreciate your, your um, coming this evening and the correspondence because that is something that I feel very strongly with as well and together I think and when I say together it's not just this board this administration it's this community which involved the parents and the students and our staff and everyone we will certainly hopefully make the best decision for you know everyone but sometimes it's you know we're, we always have the few that it may not be the best for so thank you Thank you, Ms. Wielden. Uh, I'd just like to commend um, the Human Resources and the whole administration for being able to hire 92 teachers. <laughs> that is really <laughs> remarkable, and I'm jealous. Okay, as a <laughs> person in the private sector, I'm jealous, and I, I need to learn from you all. So congratulations. That, that took a ton of work. Um, so, so I won't belabor the point. It was great hearing from everybody. I, I'm going to pick on my daughter over there. Gabriella, can you raise your hand right now? <laughs> so she, she is a student at Northside. I, I speak about her sometimes. She had practice today, and I said, I think you should come tonight. And there's a lot of really important topics for us to discuss. And I thought all the information was very well presented. I appreciate um, the research that went into it. I appreciated the care, the emotion. For some people, I thought that was really good. I, I'll refer back to Dr. Shedd's comments at the beginning on what it takes for us to be successful as a community and it stay flexible, stay calm, and stay focused. And I felt like today was, was all of those things were exhibited. So I'm just, I'm excited to move forward. I think we've got all the right people and, and information in front of us to make a good decision. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grimes. Uh, yes, um, yeah, I'd like to also thank all the parents, community members that are here this evening um, for your thoughtful input and providing um, a lot of important information and opinions um, for us as a board to consider as we move forward. And um, yeah, and, and the many emails that were received. Um, I know I'm personally guilty of not responding to many, but I can assure you they were all read over the course of the last two or three weeks so thank you very much um also would like to say thanks to dr pleak and mr phillips and anybody else that was involved in the work to help support staff um you know which are vital to our schools secure more competitive wages um, moving forward and then lastly congrats to Ms. heine on your retirement i'm sure it's a bit bittersweet but i'm sure you'll enjoy it so congrats <laughs> Thank you all very much. You can tell, I hope, that we have, I have a very thoughtful 
colleagues. I will not repeat all the great things that they had to say, but I hope you will leave this meeting knowing that your th everything was heard. Um, we have a lot to reflect on, and we will ask your input as we continue to make uh, decisions in the best interest of over 10,000 students. That's our responsibility. So thank you so very much. You've heard we have great colleagues. Thank you to all of you who are working this summer, writing grants with two and a half weeks notice. Um, and again, we are extremely thankful for Ms. Heine. She's done wonders for the school corporation. <laughs> Was there something you'd like to add? No, just, uh, okay. Yep. We'll just be uh, sure. mindful. Our next school board meeting is not until July 19th. Um, it'll be 6.30. We'll continue to be meeting here as well as taking advantage of our YouTube. We as a board will also be having a strategic planning session on July 30th. So thank you all very much. I hope it's way cooler out there now that the sun is starting to go down and that people have